morning to all of you. Welcome to our webinar on water quality management in the Nile Basin. The stream on water quality and watershed management is one of 10 streams of a set of webinars we're running this year as part of the Nile Basin Development Forum. This usually takes place uh, as a conference, but due to COVID, we are holding it virtually. We have two webinars in this stream of water quality and watershed management. The first is today. And one week from now, we'll have the second webinar. So today we focus on water quality. And next Thursday, we shall focus on watershed management. We hope to see you again after today's webinar next Thursday. The objective of this morning's webinar is to improve understanding of the current state of water quality and watershed management in the Nile Basin and explore roles for the NBI in promoting water quality uh, management. We have a number of presentations lined up for you. I will be giving you an overview of water quality in the Nile Basin just to set the scene um, for our presentations that will follow. We will be receiving presentations from the Lake Victoria Basin Commission, who are the co-hosts of this webinar. So the webinar is co-hosted by the Nile Basin Initiative and the Lake Victoria Basin Commission. We have a, a number of presentations from them. They will cover the state of the ecosystem of the Lake Victoria. Huh? Can you water quality? Going on. Can, kindly mute your. I don't know. They should come. Mute your microphone. What that there? Sorry, I'm very. So we'll receive presentations from the LBBC, covering also the the, the interventions they have made to try and improve water quality and control pollution entering the lake as well as a new program that will be implemented jointly between the LVBC and the Nile Basin Initiative. Then we have a number of presentations from the Nile Basin countries uh, on issues of pollution. There is a presentation from Sudan. We hope uh, our uh, engineer, Omer Abdelrahim, will be able to join us. His presentation is on the issue of siltation. Sudan is downstream of both uh, the white and the blue Niles, and it receives a lot of sediment and has challenges related to reservoir sedimentation and also sedimentation within the river channel that affects amongst other things, irrigation. Uh, then we have a presentation on pollution in Kampala, and we have another presentation on water quality in the Nile towards the delta of the Nile. So, and towards the end, we shall have a panel discussion. So these imminent speakers will address the issue of what we do about the water quality so that we don't stop at only talking about the problem, but we should move towards addressing. And of course, one of the tools for addressing is through investments. So that's the lineup we have for you today. Uh, without any further ado, let me, give you the overview of water quality to set the scene for our discussion of this morning, for the discussions of this morning. This is a brief overview of uh, water quality issues in the Nile Basin to set the scene for us and to get us talking. Next slide. Water quality in the basin is affected by many factors, both human and natural. And the human factors are the ones that causing greatest 
impact, and they are the ones I'll be talking about. In the headwater regions of the Nile, the headwaters are in the Ethiopian highlands and in the Nile equatorial region. A combination of hilly terrain, high population density, and rise, rapid rising population, removal of forest cover and vegetation, expansion of agriculture, expansion of urban areas and other human activities is leading to soil erosion, sediment transport, and downstream siltation of the river channel and uh, dams. This is a big problem. And in the second webinar, we'll be talking about interventions to try and control this impact uh, of, of sedimentation and siltation of reservoirs. In the Great Lakes region, that's in the Nile Equatorial region, inflow of organic matter and nutrients from non-point source pollution is leading to eutrophication of the Great Lakes. Those of you who <clears throat> have been to Lake Victoria, you know its problems of algal blooms, oxygen depletion, fish kills. We'll hear more about this from the LVBC and from the presentation uh, on pollution in, in Kampala. Agriculture is another major impacting activity. Within the headwater regions, the agriculture is largely dependent on rain, rainfall. Actually, 90% of the land under agriculture in the Nile Basin depends on rainfall. Only 10% is irrigated. And that agriculture is, so, is characterized by subsistence level uh, production, little farm holds, uh, little mechanization, low level of agricultural inputs, including fertilizers and pesticides. And so the main problem from this agriculture is inflow of sediments and nutrients into the water bodies, into the lakes and rivers and wetlands. Uh, because of the level of input is small, we don't have such a widespread problem of fertilizers and, and, and pesticides. In the downstream areas where they are largely dependent on irrigated agriculture, the characteristics are different. The farming is much more modernized and intensive, and there is greater use of agricultural inputs, including pesticides and fertilizers and herbicides. And therefore, the pollution related to the agriculture in the downstream areas is, is different. And we shall be having a presentation uh, on this. The presentation on, from Egypt will cover some of these aspects. Next. <clears throat> Industrial pollution is an issue. Uh, it tends to be concentrated in the urban areas where we have many uh, industries. And uh, the dominant type of industries are related to agriculture. The Nile countries, most of them have agrarian economies. The common types of industries are coffee halaries, grain milling, sugarcane milling, fish processing, milk processing, soap manufacture, edible processing, breweries, soft drinks, manufacture, meat packaging, confectionaries, bakeries, ETC. These type of industries produce a waste that is high in organic matter, suspended solids, and plant nutrients, nitrates, and, and various species of phosphorus. Um, those contribute to the pollution and the eutrophication problem that we're seeing, especially here in Lake Victoria, but also um, and the areas adjacent to cities, um, the, the, the parts of the, of, of the basin that are adjacent to cities. Besides these agriculture-related industries, we have others that have more toxic wastes. We have tanneries, batteries, paint factories, pharmaceuticals. We'll be hearing about this uh, in the presentations that we have lined up for you. Egypt, which is the most industrialized of the Nile countries, has a far greater problem related to this type of pollution. Uh, Lake Victoria, um, where we have uh, a concentration of, of large cities along the shores, including Kampala, Entebbe, Jinja, Mwanza, Kisumu, is also a pollution hotspot for this type of uh, uh, pollution. Next slide. Our large cities produce municipal wastewater, and this is partially or sometimes wholly untreated before it is discharged into the environment and causes pollution. 
uh, many of the cities, in many of the cities, the coverage of sewerage systems is very low. And uh, many of the wastewater treatment facilities for the our urban areas um, do not function properly. Mining is also another source of pollution, which tends to be localized where the mines are. It is not so widespread. The most, most, the most widespread is related to artisanal gold mining, subsistence level gold mining, where they use mercury in the processing and results in pollution of the surface waters in those mining areas. In the Sud, in South, of, in South Sudan, we also have petroleum production and the pollution of the wetlands related to that activity. And we also know that um, in the Albertine Rift region, Uganda is exploring uh, petroleum and that could be another potential area of petroleum pollution in the future. Next slide. In the entire basin, environmental sanitation, which is the management of fecal waste, solid waste, storm water, and other wastes is generally poor and leads to heavy pollution of surface waters with bacterial or fecal origin. Generally, sanitation coverage in the Nile countries is low. I think with the exception of, of Egypt, that met their targets with respect to sanitation. So sanitation continues to be poor, open defecation is still widespread in some countries up to 23% of the population practices uh, open defecation. So that leads to pollution of surface water, especially uh, with the uh, bacterial fecal origin. Outside of these uh, pollution hotspots, it can be said that the Nile waters, generally both surface and ground, are fit for human consumption <clears throat> with respect to chemical quality. But with respect to physical and bacterial quality, they need always to be treated. So the treatment is mostly to improve the physical quality and to remove bacteria so that then it can be consumed. Next slide. The basin has considerable groundwater resources whose quality is variable depending on many factors such as the rock type, the type of water source in the recharge area, the residence time of water in the aquifer, and the level of human influence. But in general, we can say that the waters are fit for human consumption, except in a few areas where we have cases of high mineralization and naturally elevated levels of calcium, carbonates, iron, manganese, fluoride, nitrate sometimes. Uh, <clears throat> with respect to bacterial quality, the groundwaters are generally good when you compare them to, to surface waters. Next slide. So that is the overview of water quality in the Nile Basin. Of course, it is a simplification <clears throat> and hopefully the papers uh, that will come after this will shed light uh, in, into uh, the water quality. And while we can say that uh, the water quality in the basin is generally good, um, it, it is not comparable to some areas uh, like in China where development caused total death of, of fresh waters. Uh, we note that pollution in the basin is on the increase and it calls for concerted efforts by all actors at national level and at regional levels to try and manage this so that we can continue to enjoy the benefits of the Nile waters for our population, both the present population and the future population. Briefly, that is the highlight of the water quality in the basin. Let me now invite our first presenter, who is uh, Mr. Paul Kariuki. Paul Kariuki is the M&E officer for the Lake Victoria Basin Commission. He will be giving us a presentation on the state of the ecosystem of Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria is one of the two principal sources of the Nile, and it is uh, an economic growth region for the East African community, and he has a number of challenges uh, that Paul will be highlighting. Paul, you're welcome. You have 10 minutes. Dr. 
welcome. We are seeing your, your presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Aza, and uh, uh, good morning, everyone, once again. Uh, I'll briefly put take in, you put through. Put it in slideshow mode so okay. that it fills the screen. Is it there? Yes, you are there. Okay, great. So like the, Dr. Aza has said, my name is Paul Karioki. I work with the commission and I will briefly take you through uh, my presentation on the status of uh, uh, the ecosystem of uh, Lake Victoria Basin. And uh, without uh, much ado, I'll go straight to just give you a, br a brief uh, background on uh, the lake. Uh, it's, uh, one, it's, the, it's the largest freshwater ecosystem in Africa and the second largest in the world with a surface area of uh, uh, about 68,000 kilometers square and uh, draws its water from a catchment area of around 180,000 kilometer uh, square, an area which uh, uh, is home to around almost 50 million people now uh, that live and reside in the, in the basin. So the average depth of the, of the lake is about 40 meters and uh, the maximum you can get in terms of depth, that is uh, 84 meters. So it's a pretty shallow lake and uh, any disturbance uh, on the catchment uh, that hinders inflow of water and uh, affects uh, release has a severe implication on um, its resilience. Uh, it has a shoreline length of around 4,000, uh, almost 5,000 kilometers, and uh, its uh, average volume in terms of water is uh, 2750 cubic kilometers of uh, water at uh, most of uh, the time. Then the major source of uh, water for the lake is uh, mainly precipitation, uh, accounting for 82, and with the rivers that drain into it from the catchment area, catchment that I talk about over 180, uh, uh, accounts for 18 percent. So we see a uh, bulk of it comes from majorly precipitation. And how do we lose this water? Uh, about 76 of it is lost uh, through evapotranspiration and only 24 uh, percent exits the lake through the, uh, uh, the Nile River uh, as the, the only outlet for the, for the lake. Uh, it has a, a water residence time of uh, 23 years. And uh, that means uh, uh, that's the amount of time uh, our a particle will, will, will uh, that just enter the lake will take to leave the lake. Uh, that's around 23 years and a flashing time, uh, which is uh, the duration it takes for the entire water to be renewed is around 123 years. You can see with these variables, then it means the more you introduce pollutants and things like that into the lake, then it, it poses a big problem because this is how long it will take to flush them out for instance, or uh, for them to leave the lake naturally. So 23 years uh, of residence time is long. So once you introduce pollutants, uh, the implication is that you will have to live with that for that uh, prolonged du duration. So the lake is shared, like you can see on the map, uh, among us, the riparian partner states of Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and uh, we have Rwanda and Burundi also on there, uh, sharing uh, catchment like uh, illustrated uh, there. So what are the key uh, uh, major aspects to do with its state, current state? Uh, we have had a challenge uh, 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 with um, updating our, um, our, our figures, primarily because of funding. Some of these things require quite uh, uh, intensive investment in terms of funding to undertake basin-wide ecosystem and uh, water quality assessment. So, but we have been trying to sample around, uh, particularly on the water quality, BOD, COD, and uh, on the few points that we have sampled, this is not a representative of the entire lake, but just to give us a, an understanding, we have uh, been intervening and as a result of those interventions that uh, have been going uh, on, we have been able to reduce, for instance, if I can take BOD as uh, one of the, uh, the key elements, 
this has declined from 250 milligrams back in 2015 to uh, some of the hotspot now uh, reporting 57. 0.5 in, uh, in 2017. So you can see, with continued and sustained intervention, these elements can be can be addressed in, in terms of water quality. Of course, water quality parameters are quite many, like uh, Dr. Aza has uh, highlighted there, and most of them don't uh, uh, really look good, though they are still within the, uh, the range that is uh, suitable for domestic use. But uh, continued interventions on this will still be needed to, en to ensure that uh, it's addressed. In terms of algal blooms, we have had massive algal blooms uh, that is now increasingly dominated by potentially toxic variety of uh, the blue-green uh, uh, algal blooms. And a major hotspots on this is the Winam Gulf, uh, the Machinson Bay and the Mwanza Gulf is where we have this uh, as a major problem and because uh, that will be associated with the uh, urbanization around these gulfs and the number of industries that we have that are ejecting a lot of these uh, nutrients that power the growth of uh, these algae. Then in terms of uh, the turbidity, I think we have uh, had a decline uh, over the years uh, uh, from five meters in terms of transparency, water, lake water transparency uh, to now currently just one meter. If you are to look through, then uh, that's the farthest you can go uh, in terms of uh, where we are with the quality. And what that does, it means it impairs penetration of light into, into the lake, which in turn affects um, uh, a lot of other ecosystem functions uh, like beneficial algal for the fish and uh, uh, things like that, uh, competition for oxygen in the lake. And again, it has an impact on uh, the uh, uh, BOD which leads to some of these uh, zones, uh, some of the parts of the lake, especially the deep one, the, the deep parts are essentially technically dead around mainly the, those gulfs that I mentioned because of this, these challenges. Then uh, excessive water has in proliferation, which uh, uh, has choked most of our navigation routes. We have Identify the major routes uh, of our navigation, which are normally affected. Sometimes they cripple uh, the movement of uh, vessels plying the, 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 the lake. We have some of our fishing grounds also affected. Uh, the landing sites have been blocked, ports and pyres also. And uh, the uh, hydropower generation units that are uh, uh, directly linked to the lake or the rivers that have uh, drain it to it also uh, get blocked and. Uh, 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 affected in that way. Then, of course, we have most of our towns around the basin, depending on water abstraction, either directly from the lake or from the rivers that drain into it. Also, those ones are also affected by this uh, excessive water has in uh, proliferation. Although, although of late, uh, in the last three, like three years, uh, the challenge has not been that big. We have seen this um, uh, re remaining at a manageable level and uh, in Kisumu, for instance, where, where our headquarters sit, we have had a quite a prolonged duration without this uh, challenge. In terms of micropollutants, I think uh, we have a problem, although not uh, serious, uh, to the level of uh, being alarming uh, of heavy metals like uh, uh, copper, mercury, uh, chrome, and uh, uh, lead, uh, as well as zinc, most of these uh, mainly emanating from the agro-processing industries around the, ba the basin, uh, the sugar uh, factories, the, uh, the agrochemical uh, industries, uh, and also the, the effluent treatment from the, these municipal, municipal wastes, waste. So you find this uh, mainly originating from the local and the urban industrial effluent. Except for mercury, which I think the challenge is coming from mainly the, the mining uh, activities uh, around the lake uh, for gold uh, and uh, things like that. So, and uh, the biggest uh, 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 culprits, these will be the Atsino miners, like Dr. Aza pointed out. These are the ones that uh, really are unregulated in terms of how they, they, they do this. So uh, I think there is a problem with going to the next slide. It doesn't go automatically, so I have to keep going in and out. So in terms of uh, fisheries, the fish species, I think uh, the lake has experienced uh, 
quite uh, dramatic ecosystem change over the, over time, and that, uh, like I mentioned, has uh, resulted into loss of uh, uh, a lot of uh, mainly the hypochromine uh, fish species. Currently, the lake uh, and its satellite wetlands is home to about. Uh, 200 different fish species, and that has been down from around 500 species. Uh, commercial fishery for, for the lake is, however, by, dominated by three, the Nile, Tilapia, and the Daga. The Daga, and they constitute about 95% uh, of the total of fish, fish uh, catch in the lake. So uh, out of this catch, uh, from uh, the survey, we did collaboratively with the Lake Victoria Fisheries Organization in, uh, from uh, 2020 to 11 to 14. The last survey I think we did was in 2014. On average, the value of uh, the landed fish has been around uh, 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 1 million uh, tons, which has a value of uh, initially in 2011, it used to be around 550 million US dollar, but now that is, of course, because of the change in, in price, though the volume has remained the same, but the value has uh, uh, steadily increased to 840 in 2014. But in terms of uh, the metric tons, we have had uh, the 1 million uh, oscillating around, around there. The total biomass of the fish in the lake uh, 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 has also been steady and uh, dominated by uh, dominated by the, the three commercial species that I mentioned. Uh, wetlands are very critical for this ecosystem because uh, they are the ones that filter most of these uh, pollutants that come in. And uh, yeah, I'm almost there. Uh, in terms of uh, 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 wetlands, our st the state of our wetlands, I think we have a problem. We have, these have been declining from, um, uh, 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 quite uh, budging uh, acreage of uh, wetlands to now about, about that four, which we can consider major ones uh, that comprise of 90% of the total wetlands in the basin. And most of these are in Uganda and uh, Tanzania mainly. 23% um, uh, of our wetlands are, are considered to be moderately degraded, while some, uh, another 23%, uh, is also threatened by encroachment. And uh, these uh, are worrying trends that we really need to, to keep looking at. So what are the main factors responsible for the changes uh, and that state that we are, we are seeing? Of course, there are more challenges with the lake. There are more, uh, I can talk about the status of ecosystem, but in a nutshell, uh, those are the key ones. And they are driven by a number of uh, factors. Some of these are stresses within the lake, overfishing, the introduced species like I talked about, and fluctuating le level. From the littoral zone that's around the lake, the construction and farming also is a, a major a, a, a challenge with uh, uh, a lot of our wetlands around being converted into land, into urban areas, uh, residential areas, and that poses a big challenge. Uh, from the basin itself, the catchment area that I talked about, we have a lot of poor land use practices that uh, continue to lead to land degradation, deforestation, and of course, nutrient loading and eutrophication. All this is a, a, a quite a big challenge. Then there are stresses from outside the basin uh, in terms of mainly nutrients and uh, nitrogen and phosphorus which are transported uh, either uh, through wet and dry deposition and that contributes to the eutrophication challenge in the lake. Then um, uh, the other one would be the population explosion and rapid urbanization as well as industrialization that goes together. And we have uh, of course been uh, now experiencing the challenge of climate change. The extremes that come with it have affected us recently. Most of you experienced the the flooding that was uh, uh, around the, the lake with some of the residents being uh, submerged. So these are, the, uh, in a nutshell, the, the key issues. So uh, how do they impact on the economic viability of uh, the basin? Uh, we have reduced navigability because with the water higher simple proliferating, like I've mentioned, then the use of the economic use of uh, the lake is impaired impaired in that the routes uh, are made a bit difficult to navigate, to do fishing, to do water transport. Uh, trade on the lake is also impaired and also tourism activity. Nobody wants to come to a lake that is heavily invested with, uh, infested with uh, hyacinth and other aquatic weeds. It's an ISO. Then uh, fluctuating lake levels also uh, have an impact on uh, the water abstraction. Uh, most of the cities and towns around depend on oh, direct I, abstraction. I summarize now. 
Yes, yes, I, I'm there at Aza, uh, and uh, 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 that has a bearing on uh, the, the economy. So in terms of, uh, the, uh, in a nutshell, I would say uh, a lot of this challenge poses a major threat to the regional economy and livelihoods of community that directly or indirectly depend on uh, the lake and its basin. And there is need for us as partners, as the people working in the basin, as stakeholders, to come together to look for ways and avenues uh, and resources uh, to ensure that the ecosystem health of the, the lake and its basin is maintained. And I think the commission has been embarked on this journey. We are partnering with the different development partners, our partner states themselves, to find solutions to some of these uh, very pressing uh, uh, challenges. So Dr. Aza, I think uh, I will end it there. And I know my colleagues we, from their presentation, they will elaborate on mainly what are we doing? What are the, some of the interventions that are going on to help us uh, address some of these uh, manifest challenges? So I end there and uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Paul, for a very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, participants, these presentations will be available uh, after the webinar. You will receive a link where you can be able to download them. This was very interesting. Thank you so much, Paul. Next, we are going to have a presentation from engineer Asen Mukuba. And uh, Mr. Mukuba is the, um, is the IWRM program coordinator for the LDBC. Um, um, as he loads his presentation, I want you to recognize the presence of Isaac Yabuel, your former TAC member from South Sudan. You're welcome, sir. And I also recognize Philip Saile from UNEF Gems. Many decades ago, while I was still with the Ministry of Water, I used to participate in Gems Water. We also have John Owino with us from IUCN. You're most welcome, plus many other eminent dignitaries in the region. I say the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Azra. Uh, of course, I'm going to build uh, my presentation on, uh, the, on the previous speaker, my colleague, uh, Mr. Paul Kariuki, where, uh, of course, I will present uh, some of the uh, some of the investments that, uh, or maybe other uh, measures or interventions. Uh, that uh, the Lake Victoria Basin has actually uh, pollution uh, over the lake. So, of course, we, we, the, the, the commission has tried to address uh, the pollution, uh, be, be it non, from non-point sources or point sources, but of course, there have also been some other uh, measures that we can call non-structural measures, but uh, mainly this presentation will, will tackle uh, the structural measures. And then of course, at the end, I will highlight uh, some of non-structural measures that, uh, that, uh, that we are put in place uh, to contribute uh, to reduction of po pollution. Of course, uh, here, uh, this picture shows uh, far upstream uh, this is uh, River Nyabarong in Rwanda. Uh, you, could, you can see how catchments the lake. So to address some of the issues, of course, uh, one of the investment or one of the projects that uh, was uh, undertaken uh, 10 years ago uh, is uh, the Lake Victoria Environmental uh, Management Project. Uh, which of course uh, happened in two phases, phase one and phase two. Uh, the project had a, had an objective or objectives, of course, in two folds. Uh, one, to improve the collaborative management of the transboundary natural resources uh, of the Lake Victoria Basin among the partner states. So bringing all the partner states together to try uh, and find solution uh, jointly, uh, holistically uh, to the basin. A second it was, of course, to improve the environmental management of targeted pollution hotspots and selected degraded subcatchments for the benefit of the community, of course, uh, in the basin. Uh, this project was, of course, uh, funded by the World Bank, uh, GEF, and CEDA, uh, of course, uh, countries, partner states that were involved, uh, of course, 
uh, some took loans. Uh, and of course, they were also a part of the financing that came as a grant, uh, mainly to coordinate uh, the different activities in partner states, but at the regional level to support the regional arm to be able to coordinate those activities down. So the project lasted, of course, for nine years, from March 20, uh, 2009 until December 2017. And uh, maybe to highlight some key, maybe outputs or impacts, if are any. Uh, of course, uh, one of the water quality parameters that uh, my colleague uh, Kaliuki has mentioned, uh, where of course uh, we have issues within, we, within Lake Victoria is, is of course the BOD uh, contained in the effluence that uh, that we, dis we discharge into the lake. So within this uh, particular intervention. Uh, approximately uh, the pollution load was reduced by about uh, 600 uh, tons per year through catchment management and conservation uh, in the different hot spots implemented. Uh, of course, uh, the, 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 the approach was to no, uh, was also to improve, uh, let's say, uh, livelihoods. So some community development initiatives, of course, were supported. Uh, here we are reporting, of course, about 704. Uh, where, of course, uh, communities would participate in prioritize uh, about uh, maybe 20,000 hectares of land, of course, uh, were improved uh, through sustainable uh, land management practices. Uh, but of course, the project also touched on the, on the sanitation issue, uh, where about uh, 300,000 300, people uh, were supported to access to uh, improved sanitation. Uh, we, the project also uh, touched about, of course, a 13 urban pollution hotspot, uh, and uh, they actually uh, supported some preliminary uh, technical uh, designs of wastewater treatment facilities that were supposed, of course, uh, to be to be taken on board or to be financed uh, after the, pro uh, the the project. Uh, another, of course, uh, uh, aspect uh, or another uh, key uh, output, of course, of the of the project was the adoption of the cleaner production uh, by industries uh, through trainings and other support, which of course is geared to also improve uh, the water quality uh, in, the, in the basin generally. Uh, of course, uh, the, pro the project also uh, touched on the maritime na uh, navigation issues, uh, as uh, of course uh, my colleague Paul uh, has mentioned. So about uh, 37 locations were equipped with the navigational aids, uh, because of course, when there are accidents, uh, there are loss of lives. Uh, some, of course, some ships now transport oil, so there could be some oil spills. So it, it was uh, very important that uh, maybe the lake be equipped with these navigational aids, uh, kits. And of course, uh, these were a few, but uh, we still have some other interventions uh, that are now uh, trying to increase this number. Uh, another, uh, of course, uh, other, other investments uh, were geared to address maybe point source pollution, uh, municipal wastewater management, uh, things like that. So one, of course, uh, one of the key investment or project that uh, LVBC undertook was the Lake Victoria uh, Water Supply and Sanitation Program that aimed to contribute to reduction uh, of pollution uh, flowing into the lake through improved uh, improvement in sustainable uh, water supply sanitation infrastructure, uh, which of course it took place in 15 uh, secondary towns in the Lake Victoria Basin. So the project was, of course, funded by the African uh, Development Bank to the tune of about uh, 102 million US dollars. 
the project of, uh, from uh, 2011 uh, until uh, uh, September 2018. 20, uh, if I'm to highlight maybe some also uh, key uh, outputs, uh, project uh, quite a lot uh, maybe has been have been achieved, uh, but of course uh, for the interest of time. Uh, we have maybe captured uh, a few, but uh, of course, uh, which address uh, today's topic. So in terms of water supply, of course, this project improved uh, water supply for, for that benefited about uh, 780 uh, residents in the 15 uh, selected uh, towns. Uh, of course, uh, the water supply coverage uh, was increased to uh, 85 percent, at least 85 percent in those towns. Of course, in in some of those towns, percent, uh, but of course, to at least uh, the river water in 250, it was of course uh, not an easy to to to. Uh, to achieve a uh, hundred percent in all the fifteen towns. Uh, another maybe a, a key a output, of course, is uh, the achievement of thirty thirty percent sanitation coverage, uh, which of course was the targeted value uh, you had uh, in a, in our first presentation, but also even uh, in in the in the introductory uh, presentation. Uh, sanitation is still an issue. Of course, uh, uh, partner states are uh, really investing more in water supply, but of course, the development in that particular sector does not go in tandem, though, of course, there are all these efforts to also try and raise uh, the water, uh, the, the sanitation aspect of it. So another maybe a, a, a Output was of course fifty percent coverage. Okay, yeah. So we had also a 50 percent coverage of public places with with sanitary facilities, of course in the Uh, in the targeted areas. Uh, and ongoing is the, elect the Federal Republic of Germany, the European Union, uh, of course, uh, through, through KFW and of course with the counterpart funds from partner states. So this, this program, uh, of course, it's three years. Uh, but it's phased. So the first phase, of course, will be three years. It, it, it aims to improve the world. I said your connection is weak. Your, your, your connection is weak, so maybe just wind up. The ability within the Lake Victoria Basin but through strategic and sustainable management, uh, we have currently, we are undertaking, of course, feasibility studies, which will, of course, lead to detailed designs and actual construction. Yeah, so, same program, we have, a, a, we have four is to do a constructed wetland. Uh, in Kisumu here, we want to do sanit. Uh, Mwanza, we intend to, uh, of course, increase uh, or expand the sewer connection to an existing wastewater treatment plant. Uh, whereas in Kigaro, of course, we intend to, uh, to construct details of our, maybe the expected results from the four uh, HPIs.
Uh, 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 intervention was the engaged green growth uh, within the Lake Victoria Basin, please, of course, the use of investments. Oh, so let me see. Hello? Please proceed and summarize. Okay. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, you may was, also turn uh, off your camera to improve. Turn off your camera, we just hear your voice. Okay. Yeah, so so the last intervention, of course, I, I would want to present was uh, this uh, uh, in, uh, engaging, of course, uh, the private sector uh, in uh, greener production and green growth in the Lake Victoria Basin, uh, which, of course, is funded by the Nordic uh, Development Fund and the World Bank, which, of course, lasted three years. Uh, finally, of course, as I mentioned, we have also been able to come up with uh, some non-structural measures. Uh, of course, we have uh, East African industrial and municipal uh, efferent standards that were gazetted in 2016. Uh, we have uh, been able to, of course, uh, have a harmonized policy on water resources management. Uh, under the, 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 the current, of course, partnership with, with the Nile Basin Initiative, uh, we will come up, of course, with a harmonized policy on water quality management. Uh, under the, the IWRM program, we intend also to, to develop the Lake Victoria Basin Water Directive Framework, which is, of course, inspired by the EU uh, Water Framework Directive. And of course, we have also a Lake Victoria Transport Act uh, or, or uh, to, to, to try and regulate, of course, transport on the lake and uh, handle different issues that can hamper uh, water quality. So thank you very much. Sorry, my internet, of course, wasn't good, but of course, uh, the presentation will be availed uh, to, to, to the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asain. Uh, Benjamin, you are next. Benjamin Sekamuri. I hope your connection will be better, but maybe to be on the safe side, turn off your camera and we follow from your slides and your voice. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we see your screen. Put it in full mode. Okay. Um, good morning. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Benjamin Sekamli, and I will quickly um, highlight the areas in which NBI is collaborating with uh, the Lake Victoria Basin Commission uh, on, in water quality issues. And of course, this is in recognition of the fact that uh, there's a lot uh, that we can harness from each other uh, in an attempt to manage water quality issues within the region. Uh, we are currently uh, partnering in two projects. The first one is called Nile Cooperation for Climate Resilience Project, uh, which is uh, basically a project of the Nile Basin funded by the World Bank. Uh, it's a five-year project that uh, is, has just started uh, this, this month, in March 2021, and is running up to 2025. But the Lake Victoria Basin Commission is implementing a component, um, a small component, which is water quality policy and institutional harmonization uh, running for a period of three years. And of course, uh, the Lake Victoria Basin Commission is running that particular component because it has grown from its mandate, which among other things includes harmonization of policies, laws, regulations, and standards within uh, the Lake Victoria Basin and of course the partner states. The other project that we are partnering with NBI is uh, the Lake Victoria Basin Integrated Water Resources Management Project, which my colleague, um, Engineer Sen Mukubwa, has just presented. Uh, it's a three-year project, a program that is running, run, started last year and is going up to 2023. Um, it has a, a series of components, like my colleague highlighted, but specifically in this partnership, we are engaging in the area of water resources modeling tools where we intend to use uh, the Nile Basin support system and enhance it to address uh, issues of water quality within the Lake Victoria Basin. 
I'll give a general context to these uh, 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 to these projects. Uh, first of all, uh, we appreciate the fact that the Nile Basin is shared by 11 countries, and five of these countries share the Lake Victoria Basin. In the map there, you will see the, the area highlighted green, that is the Lake Victoria Basin, that is shared by uh, the Republic of, of, of Burundi, the Republic of Rwanda, United Republic of Tanzania, the Republic of Kenya, and Republic of Uganda. Now, these share the basin, but in the Lake Victoria Basin, we also have, uh, of course, included South Sudan. Um, and so clearly, you see that the Lake Victoria Basin is a subset of the Nile Basin. But the Lake Victoria Basin now has specific fo focus on uh, water quality management within the lake. And so both basins, the Nile Basin and uh, Lake Victoria Basin, exhibit a lot of spatial and temporal challenges. And of course, uh, issues of climate change amplify such challenges. And the impacts that we have had with uh, regard to climate shocks, uh, of course, impact the economy within the Nile Basin countries. And so there's need for regional and national and community efforts in combating these uh, challenges. And that is the element that we are bringing in partnership. Um, and of course, we appreciate the fact that there are so many opportunities uh, to take a cooperative and collaborative approach to decision making. And of course, ultimately, if we do this, we shall um, achieve uh, benefits related to social economic uh, development within the basin. So I'll now zero in to the, the first project that I mentioned, which is the Nile Corporation uh, for Climate Resilience. Uh, its broader project uh, development objective is to improve mechanisms for cooperation, improve mechanisms for cooperation on water resources management and development within the Nile Basin. The key word there is mechanisms for cooperation. And of course, that is a wide range of things. It has a series of components as highlighted there advancing Nile Basin-wide cooperation, uh, improving mechanisms for cooperation within the Nile, that is the Nile Equatorial, Equatorial Lakes region, uh, improving mechanisms for cooperation within the Eastern Nile. Uh, and then the fourth component, which is water quality in the Lake Victoria Basin is the component that we are now talking about, um, where the LVBC is also providing uh, support in, uh, with regard to the component of, of policy harmonization. And then we have the fifth component, which is the enhancing stakeholder engagement within the Nile Basin. Um, it has mainly five thematic areas as highlighted. Um, and, and each of the centers within the Nile Basin is contributing to the uh, thematic areas as indicated uh, by those black ticks. And specifically, the Lake Victoria Basin Commission is contributing, first of all, to the platform for cooperation and then uh, water quality investment planning and prioritization. Now, ultimately, uh, when we go through these processes, what we intend to achieve is, is, is um, uh, investments, water quality investments that are geared to improving water quality within the lake. And so um, whatever we are doing is, is geared uh, to making sure that the quality of, of water uh, within the Nile Basin, but also within the Lake Victoria improves. And of course, the commission here uh, will work with partner states and East Africa of the East African community. And of course, we'll work with the NBI, uh, mainly through uh, uh, the NAIL Equatorial Lake Subsidiary Action Program, that is NAILSAP, which is an investment arm of, of, of the Nile Basin Initiative. We shall work together because that is our geographical scope. It does not really expand beyond the East African uh, community partner states. And once we work with the NLSAP, we shall clarify opportunities to harmonize these policies related to water quality management within the NEL region. And that is the area that we are focusing on, which is policy and institutional harmonization. And so what is the, the, the aim of uh, this policy and institutional harmonization uh, under this project? We shall review and prepare uh, policy recommendations, uh, of course, uh, to the existing water quality management policies within the countries of the NAIL. We appreciate the fact that there are already existing policies, so we shall review these policies and be able to identify what gaps do exist within these policies, and we shall make uh, policy recommendations with regard to that. And once we have done that, the key output that we shall have there is uh, a recommended uh, regional 
uh, harmonized policy that includes standards ranging from data collection, processing, archival, retrieval, and sharing of water quality data. But most importantly also, how would we jointly identify and, and prioritize water quality investments that are geared to improving water quality management within uh, the basin? The second aim is uh, to develop uh, a regional water quality management strategy and action plan. And so once we have identified these gaps and, and uh, the, the, the standards and all that, we shall be able to, to strategically plan for the, for the management of water quality within the lake as, and, and the overall Nile Basin, uh, sorry, but of course, looking at the Nile region. And uh, of course, we shall also in this particular case, um, include the roles of the different institutions and the responsibilities, and of course, a financing plan. Um, that was the first pro pro project where we are engaging. Now, the second one where we are engaging is the Lake Victoria Basin IWRM program, uh, which is a program, of course, of the uh, Lake Victoria Basin funded by KFW and uh, European Union. And so in this particular component, we, we are developing a water information system and uh, uh, the Lake Victoria Basin, that is the Lake Victoria Basin water information system, where we intend, of course, to have a suite of tools that can guide us in uh, decision making uh, and, of course, prioritization of water quality investments, like we have seen the, the, the four high, high priority investments that were are being developed in the partner states. So uh, alongside this, of course, we have identified that there is already a tool, which is the Nile Basin DSS that has already been developed and is being used in the region. And so we don't have to, to, to invent the wheel, but rather harness uh, the potential that this tool has and then enhance it to address the challenges of water quality, specifically looking at the lake. And so we are collaborating along that area. Of course, we shall look at uh, uh, data acquisition and data management uh, arrangements. And of course, we have expertise here at the Lake Victoria Basin, but also there is expertise at the Nile Basin Initiative. So we can harness the efforts um, and of course work together to, to achieve the common goal. And of course, we shall also cooperate on areas of knowledge management. That snapshot so shows a, a user interface uh, plan for the Lake Victoria uh, water information system. So in a nutshell, uh, that is, those are areas that we really are cooperating to LVBC and NBI. And we think that partnership is very key in, in managing uh, water quality issues within the lake. Of course, this partnership is not only at the regional level, we're also partnering with the partner states and all the other universities and all other agencies that we think uh, can support us in the cause of uh, improving water quality within the region. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Benjamin. And uh, your voice was very clear. Uh, it wasn't breaking. Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, type questions to these uh, eminent presenters in the chat. And when we come to the question and answer session, uh, there will be an opportunity for them to respond to your questions. Please paste your questions in the chat. There are already some questions there. If you have questions, these uh, gentlemen, uh, paste them there. It was a good informative paper on uh, non-structural measures which are being planned. Uh, that complemented the previous presentations on, on structural measures. Um, we were next supposed to have a presentation from engineer Omer Abdelrahim Baskawi Mohammed who is a director in the dams implementation unit in the Ministry of Water in Sudan. But we don't have him. I'm informed that there is a power blackout in Kachu. But if later on he's able to join us, we'll give him the opportunity. Uh, he was supposed to give us a paper on effect of Khartoum city on the water quality of the Nile River. Um, if he joins us, we'll give him that opportunity. Let me invite next, um, Madam Lilian Idrakua, who is Commissioner of Water Quality in the Director of Water Resources Management, Ministry of Water and Environment in Uganda, to give us a presentation on urban pollution, the case of Kampala City. Madam Lilian, the floor is yours. Your 
go ahead. Uh, sorry, I hadn't put on my mic. Um, am I audible? We hear you and we see your screen. Am I audible? Yes, you are, and we are seeing your screen. Okay, good morning, everybody. I have already been introduced. I'm going to make a presentation on uh, urban pollution, the case of Kampala. Uh, Kampala city is uh, Kampala is the capital city of Uganda, and it is located along the shores of Lake Victoria. You can see in the map on the right hand side. Kampala has a population of 1.5 uh, million, but the sewerage connection in the city is just less than 10 percent. So most homes are using on-site septic tanks, and uh, in the informal settlements, people use uh, pit latrines. But there's a central municipal wastewater treatment plant run by National Water and Sewerage Corporation, and a few industries also have their own wastewater treatment plant. For those of you who have not been to Kampala, uh, Uganda is a good tourist destination. Uh, you are welcome to visit us, especially in uh, June when we receive uh, a Christian uh, pilgrimage to the Uganda Matasa Shrine. Uh, we have threats in urban areas, and uh, this uh, picture just shows some of the threats we have in urban cities, we have industrial emissions, we have uh, wastewater discharge, and a lot of pollution coming from uh, informal settlements and activities like car washing, but also filling of uh, the wetlands is uh, a threat to water quality in the urban areas. So what are the pollution challenges from Kampala city? Uh, we are seeing nutrient pollution from municipal and industrial uh, wastewater. There's atmospheric deposition from uh, air pollution, but there's also organic pollution from agricultural activities. We are detecting toxic metal pollution from industries uh, in the lake, as well as uh, pharmaceutical and medical residues. Plastic waste is a, a general global problem and it has not spared Kampala city. Uh, we also receive a lot of sediments uh, through storm runoff from the city into Lake Victoria. Uh, these are some of uh, the results from uh, our monitoring. Uh, Ministry of Water and Environment is responsible for water quality management in the country. And our uh, routine monitoring indicates that most of the industries are not complying to the wastewater standards. Uh, taking uh, an indicator of total suspended solids and a selected uh, few industries, we see many of them are not complying to the total standard, uh, to the total solid. Uh, uh, also, when we take uh, chemical oxygen demand as a, an indicator and looking at uh, those uh, industries like uh, distilleries and abattoirs, we see none of them is actually complying uh, to the wastewater uh, uh, standard. And some of these industries do not have wastewater treatment plants. Uh, as such, when we look at uh, the streams draining Kampala city, we are detecting uh, a lot of uh, pollution in the uh, streams that drain through the city. Uh, the graph on the left hand bottom side shows uh, a number of the streams, including the Nachivubo channel that passes through the center of the city. And uh, you can see uh, the metal pollution uh, going through this channel is uh, really very high above uh, the uh, ecosystem uh, requirements or guidelines for uh, ecosystem. Also, uh, the Kinawataka stream, as well as Namambi stream that drains one of the industrial parks in Uganda. Uh, on the left hand bottom side, uh, there is a, a graph giving uh, the total load of these chemicals uh, in the lake. Now, these are some of the photographs taken from our uh, routine monitoring. We do not have. Um, milk uh, industries, uh, processing industries per se in Kampala, uh, neither do we have sugar factories, but these photographs are just showing us what is being discharged into the environment from our industries. But in Kampala, we have abattoirs, 
uh, you see that the discharge from the abattoirs uh, being washed, washed straight into Nachivo Channel. Uh, we also have a brewery and uh, you can see the COD, uh, uh, the COD concentration from the brewery effluent is really very high. The standard is only 100 milligram per liter. Uh, we also have a problem of solid waste. Uh, in Kampala, we have a landfill at Kitezi, but we see a problem of leachate from this landfill uh, from Kitezi. This is an ending up in the environment. Now, this uh, photograph in the middle of Nachivo Channel is the waste that is pouring uh, into uh, Lake Victoria. Some results from uh, the municipal uh, pollution uh, challenge. Uh, I, I picked these results from the Lake Victoria Environmental Management Project Phase 1. Uh, the findings indicate that uh, in terms of bio logical oxygen demand loads on daily basis, uh, a lot of the organic pollution is coming from urban centers, uh, uh, much less from uh, industries that are discharging more of pollution, which has uh, uh, chemical uh, pollution uh, as opposed to organic pollution. But we see also that uh, there's a lot of organic pollution coming from uh, the fishing uh, villages that are all littered around uh, the lake. Now we have the Nachivubo swamp uh, that has been uh, performing natural purification for the waste from Kampala. But unfortunately, this uh, swamp has been grossly degraded and encroached upon, uh, thereby reducing its natural purification uh, capacity. Uh, the active wetland ve vegetation as of 2014 was only zero. 0.57 square kilometers, but uh, studies done in 2017 have shown that this has reduced further to only 0.44 square kilometers. So this has a, a very big implication uh, for the pollution load from uh, Kampala. And uh, we see the activities uh, that are encroaching uh, on the wetlands, there are settlements, uh, their agricultural activities within uh, the wetland, but we also see uh, solid waste disposal in the wetland. So the impact of this, because the, uh, the, the wetland that has been performing the purification has really reduced uh, as follows. Uh, we see uh, in the lake now uh, the impairment of all the beneficial uses. Uh, a previous uh, speaker mentioned into detail the impacts on the beneficial uses uh, of pollution of the lake as a result of pollution. Uh, at the Gaba Waterworks, we also see an increase in the cost of water treatment. And unfortunately, this cost is now being transferred uh, to the consumer. Now, recently there was a workshop where they presented that there has been also loss of biodiversity, especially in fish species as a result of pollution in the lake. Uh, sedimentation has been already uh, mentioned uh, as a problem in the lake, and this is affecting the lake morphology and hydraulics. The two graphs on the extreme uh, bottom right hand show actually how the, uh, the, the depth of the lake has uh, changed between 1962 and uh, 2012. Uh, the dark side used to be uh, uh, between two to four meters, but now we see all this has reduced to less than uh, two meters. Now, another impact uh, of pollution is, of course, water uh, pollution related diseases. And uh, we see uh, a permanent uh, cover of algal mats on Lake Victoria now. And unfortunately, the, uh, the community of uh, algae has shifted from diatoms to now uh, the blue green or the cyanobacteria that are algal uh, toxin producing. And these algal toxins have already been detected in unfortunately our drinking water, although it is still at levels that is uh, within the accept acceptable WHO uh, guidelines. 
Eutrophication has been already mentioned as a, a problem on the lake and it has associated uh, consequences like the invasive water weeds as, such as water hyacinth that has already been presented. I've talked about the algal blooms. Uh, last on the impact, I would like to uh, say something about the recent fish kills. Uh, these uh, two uh, photographs were taken in January and uh, our uh, monitoring showed that actually the cause of the fish kills was anoxic conditions in the lake. But government is doing something about the pollution uh, coming from uh, not only Kampala, but the other uh, urban centers around the lake. Uh, Uganda has adequate policy laws and uh, regulations for pollution management. We also have relevant institutions for enforce, enforcement of the laws and regulations. I have already mentioned the Ministry of Water and Environment is responsible for water quality uh, management. We have departments that are responsible for issuance of uh, wastewater permits to industries. We also have uh, the National Environment Management Authority that are all responsible for management of pollution uh, from these uh, cities into the lake. But we, are also, uh, we also see uh, several industries now establishing wastewater treatment uh, uh, facilities and we are working with some of these industries to implement what we call resource efficient and cleaner production techniques so that they minimize waste from uh, the industries. Then uh, we have a number of uh, government projects and programs, uh, some of which have already been uh, outlined by previous presenters. Um, among the projects uh, which government has implemented is uh, establishment of a new wastewater treatment plant at Bugolobi under National Water and Sewerage Corporation. Now, uh, this uh, conventional water treatment plant uh, started uh, functioning uh, last year, almost six months now. It's, it was commissioned uh, last year. It has a design capacity of uh, about 45,000 cubic meters per day. It is fully automated for sludge separation, clarification, biofiltration, and it will also uh, produce biogas. But we see other industries also uh, establishing uh, wastewater treatment plants, as I already mentioned. Uh, Uganda Breweries that is uh, located at Port Bell along the shoreline of uh, Lake Victoria has already established uh, a conventional wastewater uh, treatment plant. And going to other uh, towns, we see uh, companies like Bidco in uh, Ginger also establishing uh, wastewater treatment plants. Last but not least, uh, government is uh, continuously building the capacity of uh, the institutions that are responsible for uh, monitoring uh, or mon management of pollution in the country. Uh, these are photographs taken from uh, our uh, laboratory. Uh, we already have uh, a number of advanced pieces of equipment which we can use for monitoring pollution. And we are in the process of uh, uh, working towards accreditation of this laboratory to the ISO uh, 17025 uh, 2017 uh, version. I thank you uh, for listening. Uh, this is uh, the other picture which is enlarged when we had fish kills uh, on Lake Victoria as a result of uh, oxygen depletion in parts of the lake. Uh, you can see how uh, the lake was massively covered uh, by algae. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Madam Commissioner. Participants, if you have questions for the Commissioner, type them in the chat box and she will have the opportunity to respond to your questions. We had planned presentations to give you an overview on what is happening in the headwater region, uh, what is happening in the mid uh, Nile region in Khartoum, and then lastly, in the downstream areas in Egypt. Up to now, we are, we are unable to get uh, engineer uh, Omer to give us the picture in Khartoum, but I will invite now Professor El Sayed uh, who is a professor of uh, 
uh, in the College of Agriculture and Food Science in King Faisal University in Saudi Arabia to give us a presentation on water quality assessment in the Nile River, the Mieta branch in Egypt. Professor, you are welcome to share your screen. All right, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizer of this important webinar uh, to invite me uh, to talk about uh, water quality assessment in the Nile River, mainly in uh, the Mietta branch area in Egypt. Uh, I already mentioned that I'm working in Faculty of Science at the Mietta University, Egypt. Uh, here on the right hand side, this is a, one picture from uh, the Nile at the Mietta region. And the left picture is about where the Nile end and they made the Mediterranean Sea, the last point of the river Nile. The Nile and Egypt is the main source, as all we know, of fresh water uh, with allocation of 55.5 billion cubic meter uh, for different uses, including drinking, irrigation, industry, fisheries, and so on. In Egypt, water needs are continuously increasing as a result of increased uh, population growth and the various development, agriculture, industry, and urbanization. Agriculture alone consume uh, around 80% of the water consumption. Along with this, we have also increasing Nile water pollution, especially downstream the Nile, as we already in Egypt, we are the downstream of uh, the Nile River. And this is considered was one of the main environmental problems facing Egypt. Uh, anthropogenic activities of development have varieties of potential impact upon Nile water quality, ranging from changing in water quantity due to abstraction uh, to deterioration of water quality and aquatic life. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the Nile travel uh, around the 900 kilometers after Aswan High Dam and then divided at El Kanatev, this area here, uh, sorry, into two branches, the Western branch with called uh, Uzeta branch, and the Eastern branch is called Tamietta branch. Uh, Tamietta branch, uh, uh, the length is about 220 kilometers, uh, and includes Tamietta branch and Eastern and uh, Uzeta branch includes the Nile Delta, which is hold ecological and economic important value. Uh, the Damietta branch uh, receive polluted water from agricultural drain, from industrial effluent, and partially treated with water, uh, and as well as urban runoff and extensive fish cages. Water quality assessment, what I'm going to talk about. A change in water quality uh, usually related to depletion of sulfate oxygen, Enhanced concentration of the sulfid organic matter, including organic carbon, organic nitrogen, organic phosphorus, as well as nutrient nitrogen and phosphorus, as mentioned earlier. Also, elevated levels of heavy metals, detergent, bistrate, and so on. Uh, to assess uh, water quality, you need to understand the uh, biogeochemical cycle of main element carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Uh, carbon present on water as the sulfur organic carbon and as well as carbonate, bicarbonate. Uh, as we know, nitrogen, the sulfur nitrogen and the inorganic ammonia, nitrate, nitrate, and so on. Uh, the picture in the right you see uh, to show the, uh, the change in nitrogen species in recently polluted aquatic environment with organic matter. That starts with high concentration of organic matter and then bacterial decomposition uh, start to increase ammonia and then nitrate and lastly matter. Uh, a study that I'm going to talk about uh, uh, was designed to assess water quality in the Damietta branch. Here we chose uh, 24 sites to collect water sample uh, for physiochemical analysis of water quality. Uh, we start uh, near Benha upstream of uh, the Damietta branch uh, until the last point of the Nile in Rasulbao city. 
what we're gonna uh, what we studied in this uh, in this uh, project we studied the physiochemical bumps as all we know BH TDS AC uh, also pollution indicator including uh, the sulfur oxygen BOD COD organic matter nutrient and so on. Also we calculated the water quality index. Uh, this is a management tool to show the how good the water is. The value less than 25 mean this area is highly polluted water. Uh, 25 until 50 bad uh, water quality uh, until 70 medium uh, until 90 is good and the above 90 until 100 is excellent water quality. Uh, here are some of our findings uh, in this area and the Mieta branch, the last point of the night. TDS value was a range of uh, 170 until uh, 248 milligram per lit, turbidity uh, until 6.6. .6. Uh, the sulfur oxygen was a range of uh, 5.4 until 9, uh, and so on. Uh, here also, uh, we see the relatively higher the sulfur oxygen concentration reported in water sample collected from the Kahlia district. Uh, as I mentioned, so to turn back, we have in the Adamita branch, we have two main districts. Uh, the upstream one is the Kahlia district, and the lower or downstream one is Damietta. Usually, usually the Mieta region or the Mieta district is subject to highly polluted area than the Kahlia at this what uh, found in this study. So uh, we found that relatively higher concentration uh, as you see here, relatively higher concentration of uh, biochemical oxygen demand, chemical oxygen demand, as well as the sulfur organic matter uh, for organic carbon, organic nitrogen, and organic carbon, as well as nutrient, ammonium, nitrate, nitrate. The higher concentration was reported in the area of the Mieta district. The uh, sites from uh, 11 until 22. Uh, before this uh, upstream in the the Kahlia is district, you have a lower concentration of uh, this physiochemical barometers measure. Also, uh, good thing is that the contribution of the sulfid organic nitrogen into the total nitrogen pool uh, is up to 80%, starting from around 25, and the same also for uh, contribution of organic phosphorus into the total phosphorus uh, from 20 up to 80 percent. This means that when you assess water quality, you need to consider the inorganic uh, nutrient, uh, nitrogen phosphorus, as well as the organic matter as well. Also, in the finding of us that related to the calculated water quality index, also. Uh, we start with higher value in the Dakahliya district, uh, sample from site from 1 until 11, and this range was 85 until 92%, which means that uh, good uh, water quality, uh, compared to a bit lower value in the Damieta district, but uh, still good water quality from 73 until 85 we also have a bacterial incubation experiment, uh, which proves that the sulfur organic nitrogen, uh, up to 52% of the sulfur organic nitrogen is biodegradable by bacterial mineralization. So we, with decreasing in the sulfur organic nitrogen, you have increased uh, in nitrate concentration. So one main, one main finding of this study is that uh, the concentration of chemical elements in the Nile water were correlated with the distance downstream, mean with high quality in upstream and they get lower or medium quality in uh, downstream. Uh, also here, we have the bacterial goes for some location along the Damietta branch. As you see, here three sites with, we, we measure POD in 21 days. And you see here the bacterial growth for the uh, site in the Mieta city is higher. This means that or reflect that high organic matter load in the Mieta uh, region compared to the other uh, two sites. Uh, 
Here also we found that the water quality index for this study uh, was started from 73 until 92, or higher than uh, previous our study, which was reported uh, in 2010. The water quality value was between 62 until 76, which means that we have improving in water quality with time. What happened in the previous study we mentioned here, uh, which called the impact of fish cages removal from the Mita region. Uh, since 1984, we have extensive fish cages in, uh, in the area with more than 1,000 fish cages in that area. Uh, in 2006, there was a government decision to remove these fish cages and uh, redesign it in a sustainable manner. So we studied the Nile uh, quality uh, straight after the removal and, and Two months later, we found as here involving in the water quality, uh, as you see in this one, and also increasing the sulfate oxygen in the water. It means that the involving in water quality uh, three months later after removal of extensive fish cage. So, so uh, one of the main recommendations for our study that certain water management strategy should be elemented to reduce anthropogenic inputs into the Nile. And this can be, uh, can be done to the whole Nile, not only in Egypt. First of all, prohibition of discharge of waste water uh, from agriculture, domestic industry, through enforcement of legislation, such as uh, for us, environmental law number four for 90. 1994, uh, uh, and also the Nile Law uh, 48. Second, use of efficient treatment technique to effectively treat waste water, as we see in the last or uh, previous uh, presentation. Uh, third, reuse of agricultural deranged water along with treated waste water in irrigation, especially for new land reclamation project. Uh, one also important thing is continuous monitoring and evaluation of anthropogenic inputs and their environmental impact on the Nile water quality. Last thing to students, the integrated cooperation and the coordination between relevant sectoral authorities and the academic institute for the Nile water quality monitoring, data exchange and management of the water quality resources. Uh, thank you for listening. Here is a list of uh, some published papers that we done in the Damietta uh, branch in Egypt. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor El Sayed Badr. Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to question and answer session. And I see a lot of questions have been posted on the Q&A. Uh, I, I invite the panelists to look there and respond to some of those questions. Uh, there is a question from, uh, from Isaac Yabuel uh, to any of the colleagues from LVBC, but also any of the other presenters. Why is sanitation lagging behind water supply? Yet sanitation is the primary cause of the water quality issues we are seeing in Lake Victoria. Can anybody respond to that question? Hussein, would you like to attempt or engineer Luoga? I need your mics to speak. Yeah, thank you very much. The issue of the sanitation lagging behind is more to deal with the transboundary issues and the unplanned settlement in the area where the population growth, partner states or countries are focusing more into supplying water for now because majority of these communities, they don't have safe water. Therefore, the little resources that the governments are having, they put effort in supplying clean water for the communities. Therefore, the issue of sanitation 
that's where it lags behind. And secondly, these communities are in unplanned settlements and even their living standard is low. That means pure, are poor communities. Therefore, even their sanitation system is based on on-site eh, pit latrines and septic tanks. And those are built locally. And sometimes the challenge of floods, eh, rainfall, heavy rainfall, these systems end up flooding and even the waste end up in the uh, lake. Therefore, the countries right now, uh, they all mostly focus to provide clean water. That's why we lag a little bit behind on the provision of the uh, sewer system to connect, to ensure the safe treatment, collection treatment and disposal of this waste water. That is what I can say for that. Thank you, Engineer Luoka. That was a good response. Yes, we still have challenges of balancing um, in all our countries in Africa between water supply and sanitation. There has been another question from uh, Leona Dakwan and the colleagues from LVBC you have attempt. And it is a similar question asked by Mespin Reta Aredo. And Akwan is saying uh, there has been a lot of investment, a lot of uh, resources, loans and grants into trying to control pollution of Lake Victoria. What has been the impact? Because according to him, he still sees that the lake is still polluted, there's still algae. What have been the impacts? Have there been any impacts at all? Uh, can anybody respond? Engineer uh, Asen Kuba or Madame Lillian? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Aza. Of course, I will attempt, but uh, we have to recognize that, uh, of course, uh, one of the issues we have uh, over the lake uh, is, uh, of course, uh, monitoring. So we don't monitor, you know, uh, on a regular basis to really have uh, quite uh, enough information that, first of all, informs like decisions uh, on investments that tells us the status uh, of the basin, I mean, of the, of, of the lake uh, uh, per se. Uh, it has of course been uh, highlighted by my colleague uh, Kariuki, but uh, one of the parameter that was uh, mentioned of course is BOD. Uh, of course, Kariuki showed that uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the in the first presentation we made, uh, how the BOD levels may be kept reducing from 250 uh, milligrams per liter up to maybe around 50. Uh, of course, uh, if also we look at uh, some of the, the maybe investments that uh, were put in place, uh, we were talking about, for instance, the last one uh, we, I mentioned, we are targeting to reduce, of course, uh, roughly we, we, we discharge, you know, about 50 tons of BOD per day in the lake but uh, uh, some of the interventions, of course, uh, are geared to reduce uh, that. For instance, the Lake Victoria Integrated Water Resources Management is targeting to reduce you know, uh, that, uh, that load by eight tons per day, uh, among other things. So uh, impacts are there, uh, though uh, not uh, maybe in different, let's say, uh, parameters and maybe in a regular way. That's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you, Asain. Um, there are also questions addressed to Sekamuli from uh, Simon Peter, from Simon Etimo and uh, John Peter Obubu. And uh, they are saying, uh, do you think a harmonized water quality management policy can be achieved during the lifetime of the project that you described? And would you think it's a good idea to extend this harmonization of policies to the entire Nile Basin countries? Secondly, can you have a go at that? Thank you so much um, for the questions. Uh, the first question is uh, asking what are some of the joint water quality management investments proposed under the regional projects? Uh, so the projects that I mentioned, the two projects, uh, the process of uh, identifying 
and uh, prioritizing investments uh, that has been done, especially, especially for the IWRM program, identifies projects. Of course, projects have to be uh, localized. So you find that a project that is in, in Kisumu, another project is in Kampala, another project is in Rwanda, and so it is localized to that country. But for us, the ultimate objective is that uh, the, the overall or the optimal benefit improves uh, lake water quality. So as much as they could be uh, not really jointly uh, being implemented, uh, but, but of course we look at the, the situation from up, then what is the, the regional impact of these, uh, these specific uh, projects in the partner states. But also, of course, uh, we have uh, projects, for example, along navigation on the lake, uh, those ones are regional in nature and then uh, we are now uh, discussing a, a project a program that was uh, i think implemented some time back but uh, was not really affected uh, for joint monitoring on the lake uh, that is something that we are looking at that uh, can be a joint uh, program that can be implemented uh, by all partner states um, sharing the lake um, of course my colleagues can supplement that especially engineer hilda the other question is, do you think harmonized, uh, do you think a harmonized water quality management policy can be achieved during the life of the project? Uh, so this question is asked with regard to the um, NCCR project, uh, where we, our component is basically focusing on harmonizing uh, water quality po uh, police manage management policies. And you are, are right, Simon, that um, our three year engagement uh, in the process of harmonizing policies is not sufficient to see uh, uh, fully harmonized policies approved. And so we are conscious of that fact that um, it's uh, um, approval processes for harmonized policies is quite a lengthy process that we might not achieve within the uh, project timeline of three years. But uh, the, the ultimate goal here is to have a draft uh, within three years, because once you have a draft, then it can go through the formal approval processes of uh, governance um, uh, as as time goes on. But at least what we would have achieved is that the draft will be there. And so uh, for some of the countries that have uh, in their policies, the gaps have been identified, they can see how they can be. Uh, we seem to have lost Benjamin. If I may add yes, up on please. that. Yes, please. Yes, uh, the policy harmonization process is not a short term uh, process. After having the drafts, then the countries, they have to adopt that. And after the adoption of the policies, therefore there's a need of the implementation uh, at the country levels. So dealing in the transboundary resources, that can be a bit uh, a slow process. Therefore, the most important thing that we need to, at this point, we have realized the impact on the lake and we have ad uh, identified the need of those harmonized policies and thereafter, then implementation phase of that uh, those policies. So it will not be achieved within the lifetime, but mind that this is only a tool that is being developed, but the implementation is a long-term process. And I want also to remind you that if you see the nature of the lake as a transboundary, the flashing time is about 123 years. Therefore, you can imagine how long we have been uh, disposing or how long we have been trashing or whatever is running into the lake, it has stayed there. So what we are seeing now is a long-term impact and we are having the feedback from our ill, uh, Ill activities that we have been doing. Therefore, acting now, it is not too late. Therefore, these policies will add value. And if not, we are seeing it in our time but for our 
future and future generation. So that is all what I can add for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Engineer Luonga. Yes, it is a process, a long process. We have to start. Uh, maybe, Professor maybe Dr. Dr. Azza. Uh, yes. I would want to compliment what my colleagues uh, have responded to those uh, questions. Uh, okay, in, 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 general, in general, when you look at uh, the challenges facing the, the basin, Lake Victoria Basin, they are quite enormous. And I am making this in reference to um, the question that was asked about uh, what is the impact, what are the changes that we are seeing uh, with all these investments that are coming to the basin. We should be expecting to see changes. But in reality, I think we also have to look at the uh, converse side of things and look at what else is happening in the basin in terms of uh, uh, the rapid population growth. Uh, people are being attracted to this basin because of the potentials that it has, the fisheries, uh, new industries are coming up. The population uh, 15 years ago was uh, around uh, less than 30 million for the, in the basin, but now we are talking of 50 million. So you see those other changes that are happening are also quite dramatic. Uh, we have new uh, challenges of uh, climate change uh, which compound the, the whole situation. So the little investment that uh, we are trying to make in the basin might look big, but when you look at uh, the whole scope of the challenge, and uh, the rate at which they are increasing, then they are not commensurate with the resources that are going in. So there is need for a, a much more concerted uh, investment, much more understanding of uh, what is happening in the basin. And uh, this will require a lot of uh, uh, investment. Uh, it's a time maybe we need to also think, uh, rather than just investing in the, uh, what we are calling the structural investment, maybe uh, we might uh, be uh, getting more impact through uh, radical enforcement of uh, standards. We have harmonized, um, for instance, standards in the basin, but uh, uh, like you have seen from the lady from Uganda, the, the compliance rates are so low that uh, the investment we are making end up being uh, uh, nothing. It's a drop in the ocean if we don't, on the other hand, at country level, uh, uh, enforce uh, strictly to ensure that uh, the actors and players uh, adhere to the laid down standards so that they compl that enforcement complements effectively the investments we are making. So uh, I, I wanted to come sub supplement on that, uh, Azza. Thank you very much, Paul, for, for, for that input. It is a complex problem and requires multifaceted uh, interventions in many areas, not only structural, but also the other soft approaches. Uh, thank you much. Professor El Sayed, um, John Peter. Uh, Dr. Azza, I. You wanted to, to supplement a minute, one minute, Madam Lillian. Madam Commissioner, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Azza. I wanted to supplement on the issue of uh, sanitation and pollution of the lake. Uh, for the case of uh, Kampala, uh, recent studies have shown uh, the pollution that is uh, coming from uh, the city ends up in this sheltered bay called uh, the Inamachon Bay, which has a very small uh, interaction uh, with the main uh, water body of Lake Victoria. And uh, if you uh, followed my presentation, uh, even under LVMP, it was shown that a lot of the pollution, the nutrient pollution at least causing eutrophication of the lake, 80% of the nutrients is coming from atmospheric deposition. So yes, we can um, address sanitation from these uh, uh, urban uh, cities, the big ones, the small ones, the landing sites, but I think there's also need to focus our efforts uh, in the catchment. Uh, we need to find out where uh, this atmospheric uh, nutrients are coming from and focus our efforts there. And one of the things mentioned was that uh, it could be through bush burning. It could be through uh, air pollution. So we need to focus our efforts also uh, on the catchment. That's uh, what I wanted uh, to add. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Particulate deposition on the lake, definitely with the large surface area of the lake, ends up being in a very big load. Yeah, it's a complex problem. You must address it from all angles and not only a few. Uh, Professor El Sayed, a quick one. 
your results show that um, removal of, of cages improves water quality. And John Peter Bubu is saying, why have you not recommended total removal, total abolition of cages? Of course, we need the fish, uh, but how, how do we do it? Can you respond? All right, thank you. Uh, yes, I agree with uh, his uh, recommendation. Uh, but the point is that I mentioned uh, at that time, 1984, we have lots of fish cages, uh, more than 1,000 fish cages, which means that intensive fish cages in the small area of uh, the Mirta region. So this uh, get lots of pollutants into uh, the water uh, Nile in that area. So uh, the government decision at that time to remove all this intensive and random fish cages uh, to protect uh, the water quality. And then we can manage, as you said, we need fish. We can manage uh, the fisheries in sustainable manner that, can, that will not affect the water quality. But the picture was that lots of fish cages that give uh, pollutant into the Nile. So after uh, that time, the water involved, the quality involved, and also uh, the same decision happened in Rosetta branches, other uh, branch as well. Uh, so fisheries is still okay, but uh, in sustainable manner, don't to be intensive, don't use too much food to get pollutant into the Nile water. I hope this clear. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, the last question, uh, uh, participants, we recognize that this is a very good discussion, but we have time, we have little time and we must bring this webinar to an end. And we still have the panel discussion, which is also interesting. The last question to our colleagues in LPPC and uh, Madam Commissioner may also supplement, and it is from Philip Sile of UNEP James. What is the state of transboundary water quality monitoring in Lake Victoria? Our colleagues, can you tell us? Is there any joint monitoring that is ongoing? Who is going to attempt? Paul Kariuki? Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, I had, uh, like I had mentioned, uh, I think, thank you very much for that question. I think, uh, like I had mentioned, I think uh, over the last like uh, five years or so, we have not uh, had a very structured water quality monitoring, uh, the joint Dint lake monitoring exercise we used to have. So what we have resorted to is doing ad hoc kind of, uh, just to keep abreast with the, with the water quality in the lake. And uh, as we do that, we have also been trying to uh, uh, explore partnership, explore uh, uh, development partners who will fund such initiatives and also work out modalities to ensure that we put in place institutionalized uh, capacity for these kind of exercises. So to answer uh, you, I think uh, we do not have very structured uh, uh, one, but this is what we are working uh, towards. With the IWRM, there will be some capacities that will be put in place, and we are also trying uh, through other avenues to leverage on uh, technological advancement to ensure that even if we don't have the physical one, but at least using technology, we should be able to be abreast with the, the state of uh, uh, the ecosystem, particularly water quality. Uh, so this is an area that we really need uh, to partner in, to work with uh, different uh, people uh, who can help us uh, uh, institutionalize this as something that should be done on a regular basis. Thank you, thank you. Uh, participants, I want us Can to Can I now. add, Dr. Azza? Uh, just in a minute, and then we shall move to the panel discussion. Madam Commissioner. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Azza. Yes, from the uh, Ugandan side, I think the joint monitoring uh, stopped with uh, uh, LVMP1. But uh, from the Ugandan side, uh, starting uh, this year, January, we have uh, commenced uh, lake-wide monitoring of the 19 stations that were established on the Ugandan side uh, under LVMP1. So we hope we'll be able to collect uh, data from the stations on the Ugandan side on quarterly basis, starting January this year. Thank you very much, Madam Commissioner. Uh, our last item for today is a panel discussion uh, where we want to continue this conversation. 
And we want to look at the opportunities, but also the challenges for investments to address these challenges that we've been talking about. And the first person I'm calling upon um, to, to share some thoughts um, on this topic is the commissioner herself. Uh, and we're asking her, how can national investments in water quality management make a greater impact of meeting transparent water quality uh, management objectives? Madam Commissioner, you have five minutes. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Azza. Um, I think I, on my part, I would like to flip around that question and say, how can regional investments make a greater uh, impact at the national level? And uh, why did I flip this around? I think we have received presentations uh, from LVBC, uh, we have uh, already noted that investments uh, that were made under uh, the Lake Victoria Environmental Management uh, programs, because some of them were not institutionalized, they, they, they have not been sustainable at the national level. So I, I think for me, it is uh, a question of how do these regional investments uh, create lasting impact at the national level, not the other way around? And uh, for this to happen, uh, I am a bit actually concerned when I uh, followed the presentation uh, of uh, Benjamin uh, talking about a regional project on water quality. I don't know uh, how many institutions in the partner states know about this project because I head a department of water quality in Uganda, but it is my first time listening and hearing that there is a joint project on water quality between LVBC and NBI. How will the activities of such uh, projects or investments be sustained if the national uh, institutions that are responsible for management of water quality are not involved right from the conception of these projects. So for me, it is the other way around. Uh, we need to involve the mandated institutions right from conception of uh, these uh, projects through uh, collaboration uh, before the implementation. And uh, it's a bit of a concern when regional, uh, regional uh, uh, bodies uh, uh, go into implementation, because that means these projects will not be uh, sustainable. Uh, when the projects end, that will be the end of it. So projects uh, have to be uh, thought through together. It should be a bottom up, not a top-down approach. Uh, projects have to be, the problems have to be identified at the national level, and then uh, we uh, collaborate uh, together and see how these problems can be addressed in a sustainable manner. And those activities have to be institutionalized in the mandated institutions at the national level. Um, what, I, uh, so, because uh, if we do not uh, do that, then the sustainability of these uh, projects will remain a problem. And uh, really for me, that's a concern that uh, our approach is changing to a top down uh, rather than a bottom up. And uh, this will uh, really affect uh, sustainability of the projects. But second also, uh, I think I would like to touch on the issue of uh, uh, transparency and confidence and trust among the partner states. Uh, for us to be able to manage this uh, lake uh, well, we need to build on uh, 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 initiatives for confidence building. I know there were projects under NBI for confidence building and, uh, and trust. And uh, why, why do I say this? I think recently when we had a problem of flooding uh, of uh, Lake Victoria, we all followed what happened. 
some partner states wanted to take others uh, to the East African Community Court. This is a, a problem of lack of really trust and confidence in partner states. So for us to improve collaboration, uh, we need to improve on trust and confidence building in all the partner states. I think that's where uh, I'll stop for now. Uh, back to you, Dr. Azza. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. I think um, Engineer Hilda will be able to, to, to make some comments on some of the issues you have raised. The Nile is, is a shared resource. And the, if, if, if one country takes actions while the other doesn't take actions, we, we don't end up solving the, the, the problem that we have. So it, it calls for coordination between the countries so that they act in a coordinated and concerted manner. And that is why the harmonization of policies that uh, uh, Benjamin talked about becomes relevant. There is also need for, for, for regional and coordinated planning so that the investments which we, we, which we implement at national level will contribute uh, to the bigger goal we are trying to, to have. Um, and, and we need to employ a, a mixture of approaches, both top down and bottom up. And uh, Madam Hilda will comment about the issue of stakeholder involvement. But mm -hmm. let me invite you now, Engineer Hilda Woga. And the question too is, what are the opportunities and challenges with respect to securing investments to address the water quality issues that we see in the Lake Victoria Basin. And you can start with maybe some comments on the issues raised by the commissioner. Hilda, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aza. Yes, the commission, commissioner's concern uh, is well noted. However, I would like to respond as follows. The Lake Victoria Basin Commission is a regional institution that has been mandated by the EAC eh, under the protocol for sustainable development of the Lake Basin uh, of 2005, eh, that we are mandated to coordinate activities of all actors that have opportunities to add value eh, in the sustainable development of the Lake Victoria Basin. Therefore, we promote, we facilitate, and coordinate activities eh, of different actors, being state and non-state state actors, eh, to ensure the sustainable development and poverty eradication in the basin. And eh, in that, we have a strong governance structures, uh, governance structure that governed the implementation of the projects and programs eh, to address the challenges in the Lake Basin. And eh, that governing, governance structure, eh, we have the coordination committees from the partner states. Eh, we have the national focal points from the EAC, uh, EAC coordination. And we have the, our partner development partners and other stakeholders in the basin. So we work with them very closely. Recently, yes, we have been hit by the COVID-19. We have not been able to be able to call for the meeting for the partner states. We have tried, but because of the uh, challenges of virtual meetings to get all the countries has been we have been a little bit challenged. However, we, as LVBC, we are continuing to implement those obligations and mandates that we have been empowered to do so. NBI is one of our collaborative partner, strong collaborative partner. They got their uh, opportunity for this project. They approached LVBC. It wasn't that long time and we were there to support because our mission is more or less the same, to make this region sustainable and to conserve the water resources in the region. Therefore, the issue of informing the stakeholders is on top notch 
and Lake Victoria Basin Commission, we reach out to the partner states to inform. And actually we are planning for the sectoral council of the ministers for the Lake Basin in May. And we will inform that. But because of the urgent need of implementing of this project, we were, we had to act that way. So that is what I can say. And we have the directive also from the previous sectoral council asking the Lake Victoria Basin Commission to collaborate with NBI and that because we should not duplicate efforts and that we should also utilize our development partners resources wisely and we achieve the intended goals. So that is what I can say for that. Going back to the question of the, on the what opportunities and challenges for investment to address the pollution. Here's what I found. To address the pollution uh, control at transboundary levels in the basin. Uh, as my colleagues have presented earlier, that the Lake Basin is supporting about 50 million people and provide a variety of economic and development opportunities, including fisheries, tourism, and transboundary conservation. And let alone that the lake itself is a major source for water, for domestic, industrial, and agriculture. And it is strategically located uh, and it supports connectivity eh, through all modes, modes of transportation and outside markets. We have fishery resources, hydropower potential, wonderful ecosystems of Masai Mara, eh, where it generates a lot of revenues, mining activities that are also within the basin. So we can see how this basin is endowed, endowed with the natural resources. However, these opportunities are hindered by the number of threats that have been discussed throughout this uh, presentation. That include the population growth, unplanned uh, settlement, urban growth, industry that pollute the environment, our eutrophication and climate change, to mention few. We know that transboundary, manage, transboundary management of these resources has been a challenge. It need a collective, uh, collective efforts and integration. And we need to, to identify the governance of the transboundary uh, resources in order to be able to address those challenges. However, the Lake Victoria Basin, as it has been recognized as economic growth zone, informed the need for regional collaboration in management for sustainable development. And that's why EAC mandated the LVBC to spearhead that in order to address those uh, challenges, as well as to coordinate the stakeholders. We, we are gratitude, uh, we, our gratitude goes to the ESC partner states and all development partners who have been able to support us in the interventions that we have done. However, there are a lot need to be done. When we talk about the challenges eh, for LVBC, we look those are the opportunities now for investments. Yes, we have been able to implement some projects, harmonize some policies, Yet we need to do more because the population is growing, a lot of pressure in the resources and whatever LVBC has done in the region, mostly we can say reaching less than 10% of all the population in the lake basin. Therefore, like for example, the Lake Victoria Water and Sanitation Program, program it was just in one, city per country. Therefore, you can see how small 
this is, but it is better to do a smaller than doing nothing. Therefore, a lot need to be done. And there are some areas that we need also to, to see the investment going in. One of them supporting sustained ecosystem monitoring to know status and health of the, the ecosystem in the basin. So that is one op op opportunity that we call for the uh, development partner to look at and all the stakeholders. And the second one is undertake research to identify the status of Lake Victoria Basin, uh, as my colleague Paul uh, alluded into that. And number three, we have to look at the pollution control planning and investment to address both point and nine point sources pollution. And uh, number four, I can say restoration of endangered wetlands to bring back their ecosystem functioning. Uh, my colleague, uh, the Madam Commissioner explained how the wetlands have been degraded or been cleared to harbor the, 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 for urbanization and industrial development. Therefore, we need to restore those endangered wetlands to ensure that they perform the ecosystem that is intended and where our community depends on. And uh, number five, I would say we need to promote of less natural resources based initiatives, alternative economic uh, activities. This, we can enhance that um, value chain, value added uh, value chain into the agriculture activities. Eh? We have to do smart agriculture, uh, greening various agriculture value chains. Those are the things that we have to look into that. And the, the other one that I really look at as the most important for the economic growth in the region, opportunity in Lake Victoria, water transport, trade and tourism. The lake is beautiful and is the second uh, fresh water uh, lake in the world, but its opportunities has not been that much maximized. Okay? We see the lake as a place of death that you cannot enjoy being in the water. Therefore, we have to improve that maritime transport eh, to ensure that the people traveling in the lake, they feel safe. Eh? Therefore, we have to increase the navigation aids to install the navigation aids and also communication eh, within the lake. Currently, only 20 uh, miles, people that can be called but after that, there will be uh, no communication. And also issue of oil spills and the toxic management. We don't know how- of one minute. Yes, we don't know how these vessels, they manage their waste in the meantime. That is also we need to research out and to install the mechanism that to manage uh, those waste and to improve the transportation. Therefore, uh, in short, I will just summarize in saying that to obtain, um, we need to have a political commitment within the countries, and we need to have uh, uh, financial resources across the, the region to, to be able to address those challenges, uh, including the water quality issues. And we need also to identify the role of transboundary water management uh, across the board and uh, to enhance cooperation and integration that EAC and LVDC is fostering. So with that, uh, I, I beg to submit and uh, uh, I would also like to, 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 to maybe use this opportunity to condole our colleague, the United Republic of Tanzania and East African community for the loss of the uh, President Joseph Kondibagufuri. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Engineer Luoga, and our sympathies to all our brothers of the United Republic of Tanzania upon that uh, very unfortunate loss of, uh, of the head of state. Uh, my last panelist for today was supposed to be Dr. Michael Kiza uh, from the Nile Basin Initiative. Uh, Dr. Kiza has, uh, has uh, sent in his apologies, unable to be 
with us today. So at the end, I will ask uh, uh, my good friend Leonard um, Akwaj to make just one minute um, of comment. But I'd like to point out, and, and the question that was um, addressed to Kiza was, uh, how is the NBI looking to address transboundary water quality investments uh, in the Nile Basin in the future? We note that up to now, the NBI has made some, some, some interventions in the area of, of water quality. Um, under the Lakes Edward and Albert Fisheries project, which is a project between the Democratic Republic of Congo and, and Uganda, the interventions of water quality uh, testing, uh, the two countries have been supported with the laboratory equipment and they have mobile testing labs. In, under the MARA project, uh, 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 there has been, uh, uh, at, uh, uh, under, in the town of Bomet in, in, in Kenya, a project on augmentation of water supply, but as well as sewage disposal and treatment. In the Sio Malaba Malatisi River Basin project, a, a number of uh, potential investment projects have been identified and I think uh, studied up to previsibility stage, uh, storm water and solid waste, <laughs> solid waste management for transboundary towns of Busia, Uganda, Busia, Kenya, Malaba, Uganda, Malaba, um, um, Kenya. Uh, under the Nimur, Limur multipurpose water resources project in South Sudan, it is still um, at, at, at uh, the, 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 the studies have been completed and a number of investments uh, projects have been identified. I think uh, NELSAP is now in the process of trying to look for, 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 for development partners to support some of these investments. But there's a component on sanitation provision, in addition to other components on irrigation and water supply. Also in the Eastern Nile, under the multi-sectoral investment opportunities assessment, um, one of the uh, potential projects which came out was the Eastern Nile Transboundary Water Quality Monitoring Program. So they, they have been in these interventions, but what you can say is they have been few, uh, isolated, and their impacts at best have, have been local. Going forward, um, under NBI's new 10-year uh, strategy, um, the NBI is looking to um, um, to, to work with the Nile riparian countries, with regional economic communities such as East African Community uh, and the Lake Victoria Basin Commission uh, and other regional actors to develop a multi-sectoral and multi-country portfolio of basin-wide and regionally significant investments. This is being called the Nile Basin Investment Program. It will be based on existing sub-basin uh, um, investment programs, and of course, those originate from country investment programs, as well as the investment plans of the regional economic communities, again, those originate from the countries. Um, and we expect that these investment programs will include uh, interventions to address uh, wastewater treatment and water quality pollution control, because this has a big contribution to the question of water scarcity which the Nile faces. So making these um, waters um, uh, reducing pollution reduces scarcity that results from pollution of water, but also wastewater treatment makes the water available for reuse in areas that can reuse these waters. So let me invite now Nel, uh, Leonard Aquan in just one minute to summarize this question of NBI and investment promotion. Leonard. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Nicholas, for highlighting some of the practical uh, investment that uh, is being facilitated by the Nile Basin Initiative. Uh, I will also, uh, picking from that, I wish to state that uh, water quality is a very big issue uh, within uh, the Nile Basin. And going forward, uh, there is need to invest on issues of water quality. I think it has not uh, received uh, enough uh, focus or enough support uh, to enable its, uh, its, its operation and um, its implementation. And therefore, going forward, there is a need to focus on also water quality issues because if you look at Lake Victoria, as has been said by many presenters, 
uh, there's a lot of pollution going into it, and this covers all Lake Victoria pollution coming from the cities, coming from the households, coming from the municipalities, and also coming from industries. And therefore, at the heart of this, there is need for knowledge base. Uh, water quality issue, if you go for the physical uh, collection of indicators, it's timely, you collect it, and in seconds, it might not be relevant. And therefore, also within collecting physical indicators, there is need uh, for the region to develop uh, biotic indices, uh, which are more long term in terms of uh, when you collect them. Now, going forward, I think uh, NBI has been instrumental in um, developing a baseline, a brief course baseline survey on water quality issues. And within the current projects, the future projects that are earmarked, some of which have been mentioned by LVPC is to develop a knowledge base uh, to inform uh, water quality issues. And within this knowledge base, uh, there will be developed a water quality information system and to which all this information will go in and inform issues of investments uh, within uh, the water quality. So this will be in terms of capacity building, uh, in terms of strategic plan, and of course, harmonization of these uh, policies, and then finally developing that water quality information system. And also in terms of data collection uh, within the new program, uh, within the HydroMet program, the new program uh, of SIWA is going to have additional sensors on the HydroMet, multi-parameter probes and uh, data loggers to collect timely information on water quality. And this information will be analyzed within the water quality information system to inform investment, to inform action, to inform uh, decisions. And also within uh, the Nile Basin Initiative, there is a study uh, in, with collaboration of, uh, of, G of GIZ, there is a study on plastic, because as it is known, a River Nile contributes a lot of plastic into Mediterranean Sea. So we are going to do a cost study to map uh, the plastic debris that comes uh, from uh, the up waters comes from uh, River Nile into Mediterranean. So all these studies will build a very strong knowledge base to inform action and to inform uh, uh, investment with regards to water quality uh, intervention and management within the Nile Basin. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Leonard. Um, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to bring this webinar now to a close. I thank very much all our panelists and presenters and speakers who have made very, very uh, interesting and, and informative presentations. And also thank all of you participants who have joined in and are still with us uh, for the many questions you have asked and for the discussions in chat. There have been more questions that we're able to answer in the limited time we have had, but let's continue the discourse on the Nile Basin and water quality, even outside of this room. The presentations that have been made will be available. So um, if you visit um, the website for this uh, webinars, which is uh, www.eventleaf.com forward slash NBDF, and you go and you scroll, scroll through the programs, all the webinars which have been completed, you will find um, a link to get the recording uh, because they are recorded, but also a link to get the presentation. So they're available if you visit the website tomorrow. And we continue with the webinars up to the end of April. So keep checking the, 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 the website to look at the programs. Uh, I have said that one week from now, we shall have the second um, webinar on the water quality and watershed. And in this particular uh, webinar, we shall be focusing on, on watershed management. Tomorrow, we are beginning the webinars on climate change. There are four of them. So the first one tomorrow in the afternoon, please, if you're interested to hear about um, uh, how climate change is affecting the basin, but also the different tools which are being developed for us to be able to inform decision-making on climate change. Join the webinars tomorrow. So with these few remarks, I thank you all so much and have a good day, a good morning, a good afternoon, wherever you are. Bye-bye, until we meet again in another webinar. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, bye. Mm -hmm.